If you will, take your Bibles tonight and turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. I love that last verse of that song we just sang, Speak, O Lord, until your church is built. And if you think about it, God created everything out of His Word, His spoken Word, right? That's how the worlds were framed, how they all came into existence. And that God is doing His new creation, His new creative work uh, through His Word. And one of the things I love about ministry, if you're asking me what keeps you going, what encourages you, it's when you see the Word of God like something happens, just a spark, a light comes on, someone responds as it relates to salvation, uh, or that next step in their walk with the Lord, it's, it's awesome. And I hope that you're experiencing it in you and through you and those that you're influencing for the Lord. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, since it's been Thanksgiving, and we're going to read a rather lengthy passage, I'll let you be seated tonight. That doesn't happen too often, but I think we'll do that tonight. We're going to read this last chapter together, Second Thessalonians chapter 3. I'll stand. You just chill, okay? I'll do, I'll do all the work tonight. But uh, I guess that's my, that's my job, so I'll do that, all right? 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, let's begin in verse 1, and we'll read down through the end of the chapter. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable men and wicked men, for all men have not faith. But the Lord is faithful, uh, who is faithful? The Lord is faithful, who shall establish you and keep you from evil. And we have confidence in the Lord touching you that ye both do and will do the things which we command you. And the Lord direct your hearts into love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the tradition which he received of us. Verse 7, for yourselves know how you ought to follow us, for we behaved not ourselves disorderly among you. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought uh, with labor and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you. Not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an ensample unto you to follow us. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For, if we, for we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, walk, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ, that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing, but if, and if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man, and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. And then these closing words, Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always by all means. The Lord be with you all. The salutation of Paul with mine own hand, which is, a t which is the token in every epistle, so I write. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Uh, amen. Tonight I want to look at this subject together as we finish up our series of Dear Thessalonians by looking at, we've been talking about different characteristics that makes a church endearing, and tonight I want to look at this subject, Dear Ambition. Uh, we tend to view ambition as a negative thing. I want to discuss tonight a sanctified version of that that I think Paul encourages the church to have. Let's pray and ask the Lord to help us tonight. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the time we can enjoy together tonight, that we can enjoy tonight together in your house. Um, Lord, this day has been full of just, just little miracles, little moments, Lord, where you have brought somebody new to our church, uh, a decision has been made, um, a heart has been stirred, a mind has been transformed. Lord, those are, those are monumental things, Lord, if they're yielded to you and all that that can do, not just in the present tense, but in the future. And I pray that you'd help us not to miss those moments. And tonight, here is another one, Lord, to consider your word as we wrap up this series that we've been discussing this fall, Lord, on how to be more like this dear church and these dear believers that comprise this church in Thessalonica. I pray, Father, as we study on this last chapter, that it would stir us deeply. That, Lord, we'd be honest where we are apathetic, where we are a bit lackadaisical in our approach to ministry and into our, into our walk with you, that you would stir in us deeply. You would renew the zeal that we have maybe once had or need to begin to have, and that, Lord, you would re-engage us uh, before the coming of the day of the Lord. Bless this study, be honored in it, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. I don't know if you saw the story in the news. We made, uh, I don't know if we made national news as Worcester this past week, but we at least made the Cleveland news stations. Did you see the story of the, the wildlife we had run through our Walmart a couple of weeks ago, a deer? Um, what's funny about that story is, that occurred on a Wednesday. Wednesdays for me are a bit busy, at least when we have small groups and other things in the evening. And so I had 
I was in Walmart, whatever time this all went down, I was there. And so I was, I was, I just rushed in to pick up a couple of things and I heard just all this commotion. You ever known something's going on, but you're just too either, you just, I don't have the energy to engage this or I don't have the time to be a part of this. And so I just kept my head down, bought my few things and then left. And then that night on the news, I heard a deer walked in the front doors of our Walmart and then went out the back doors. Did you see that? And that just, and, and they showed all of his thrashing and banging. And then I'm like, you know what? That banging sounds familiar. It sounds like something I heard earlier today. I just didn't care to go over to aisle five when I was in aisle seven and find out what was going on. I, I just didn't have the initiative to do that. Can I just say tonight, when it comes to the day of the Lord, isn't it interesting that the flesh of this church, and I think our flesh, tends to react to the day of the Lord. The fact Jesus is coming back in the exact opposite response of what God intends. Why, here's the question as we begin. Why does God tell us about the day of the Lord? Why does he tell us about the rapture and then the subsequent events? He, he tells the, us these things for present impact. And my question to you as we study through this chapter is what, does, what is God after? What, what does he want me to want more and to do more and to be more uh, in light of the day of the Lord. See, the day of the Lord is not let's kick back or let's retreat to a mountaintop somewhere. It, it's to motivate us. It's to grip our lives and stir our hearts to be more for the Lord as we see the day approaching. And unfortunately, many of these believers, as we've talked about, especially in this last chapter, they were, they were uh, mishandling what God had revealed them. They were abusing they were mistreating the doctrine of Christ's return. And so in this final chapter, Paul says, no, the day of the Lord should stir you deeply. It should transform you as you anticipate this day that is shortly to come. So the question tonight is, in a world with little drive, or if they do have ambition, it's selfish. How do we who are waiting for Christ's return attempt great things for God? How do we be uh, more for the Lord uh, in this area of ambition? Let's talk about tonight three sustaining ambitions or outlines in the bulletin there that if we will embody these uh, sustaining ambitions, they will help us be the endearing church uh, that God desires us to be. Number one, first of all, in light of the day of the Lord, uh, we should have more ambition in our prayers. We need ambitious prayers. Where are the ambitious prayers? Um, I think of all the areas we struggle with in our day, I don't hear a lot of bold prayers nowadays. They're very moderate. They're very kind of safe and kind of just soft towing around problems and needs. And it used to be, I'm sure you can remember this, Dave, you're of any age, where people used to pray. They used to ask God to do miracles. They used to ask God to intervene in powerful ways in their lives, their families, difficult situations. We've become fatalists where we need to be intercessors. And so there needs to be a renewal of ambitious prayer. The other day I heard a guy say this about his wife. I don't know if you notice, we men and ladies converse. We talk a bit differently to one another or don't talk, whichever the case may be. This husband said, my wife has like 20% of the conversation in her head before she decides to bring me into the conversation. And he used this analogy. He said, we'll be driving in silence and then all of a sudden she'll just say, and then we'll pick the kids up and go straight from there. And the guy's like, we'll pick up the kids from where and where are we going after that? You know, it's like mid, mid conversation. I think sometimes with the Lord, that's how we're conversing with Him. Are you actually talking through with God what He wants you to talk through completely with Him in prayer? If He's coming back, He's a person. I think sometimes even our prayers are so intermittent and broken and kind of hodgepodge instead of completing the thought and completing the experience in a season of prayer. We need ambitious prayer or we're a bit, a bit haphazard if we're not careful. And so for having the, the, the Jesus in whose name we pray coming back for us with power means our prayers often are too tame. Uh, we, need, we need bold prayers. We need ambitious prayers if Christ uh, is truly coming back. All right, let's talk about a couple of areas under that, not on the slide, but they're on your outline. Number one, an endearing church is ambitious with evangelistic prayer. The first thing we need a renewal of in the area of ambitious prayer is we need more ambition with evangelistic prayer. And you see that in verses 1 and 2. Go back to our text there, the beginning of the chapter. Paul says this, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of God may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you. And so this prayer of evangelism, pray for the word of God to have free course. Paul's request is that they pray for the ministry of the Word. 
here's what we're dealing with. We're dealing with the lies of the devil, are we not? That are counteracting every time, I don't know if you realize, but every time right now in this room, every time the word of God is declared, there is a counter effect or resistance that's happening. Trying to distract you and distract me and discourage you and discourage me. And prayer must be a part of our proclamation of God's truth. We must pray for uh, God's word to have free course. And the idea is that it would run free, freely that it would be unleashed, that it wouldn't be tethered, that it could just do the purpose that God intends for it to accomplish. And basically what Paul is saying here, notice at the end of the verse, he even says it, even as it is with you. He's saying, I just want the Word of God to be unleashed in new communities like it was in your community. That, that just as it freely was open to you, that it would be open to others. Go back to the first letter of Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians, and look, if you will, quickly at chapter 2 and verse 13. I love this verse, probably one of my favorite verses uh, that we've covered in this series is verse 13 of chapter 2. I think I mentioned to you, one of our men said to me several months ago when we were studying this, or a few weeks ago, said, I bet this is a prayer that you pray, that this would happen when you preach the Word and you teach the Word. And I thought it was a wise takeaway. He says, for this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you receive the Word of God, uh, which you heard of us, you received it not as the word of men, but as it was in truth, the word of God, notice this, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. And so this effectual working of God uh, needs to be a part uh, of our prayer life. Um, we all say we want to see folks saved. And I just, I just put this thought tonight. I, I beg God regularly, not as much as I should, but I, I ask God, God, I want to see more folks saved as a result of our ministry. But I, I, I dare say I don't pray as much as I should, and probably you don't either. We talk to each other about that. Maybe I wish we'd see our kids get saved or a neighbor or someone that even comes. Uh, they've been coming for a while, and they still don't receive the gospel. Are you praying with ambition? God, you love this man. You love this lady. You love this young person. I'm begging you to work in their heart. And so Paul says pray with ambition in your prayers as it relates to evangelism. The ambitious spirit of our prayer should be something to this effect. Lord, if your word can work in somebody like me, as the, he did for the Thessalonians, do it in them. Do it in somebody else like me. Uh, may those prayers be a part uh, of our walk with the Lord. All right, now go back to our text and look, if you will, <laughs> at verse number two. And there's a, the opposite side of the coin, the opposite effect or response to this preaching or this evangelism that also requires our prayer. Look at verse 2, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable men and wicked men, for all men have not faith. And so this evangelistic prayer is that it might have free course. Number two, it is the prayer that they would ask for God to deliver it from the enemies of the gospel. Um, did not the Thessalonians know about this resistance? I'd encourage you to write down Acts 17 and read that, the first about 10 verses there was a ruckus in Thessalonica when Paul and the, the, the apostles preached there, and there was much resistance to the messaging that they offered to this church. And so Paul says, you know about this resistance. Pray for us, that God will deliver us and protect the message despite the resistance around us. And so you see in verses 1 and 2 that we begin with tonight that this positive and negative reaction of the preaching of the gospel, uh, it produces both of those. And Prayer allows us to be confident in our tone before both of those responses. One of the things, I don't know if you realize this, but one of the things that's most challenging about preaching the gospel or witnessing to folks, and some of you are living this out, is you don't know which response you're going to get. You don't know if it's going to have free course, and they're going to break down, and, and I'm shocked. I usually expect the second response, no thank you, or stiff arm, maybe not literally, but at least verbally but you don't know for sure if they're going to respond favorably or resist with all of their being. But prayer allows us to be ambitious, to keep sharing and keep sowing and keep preaching. And so we need to be faithful in that until Christ comes for us. I love the statement by William Carey, uh, who often has cons been considered the father of modern missions. I don't know if he would like that label or not or prefer that. But he was once quoted as saying this, expect great things from God, attempt great things for God. And I think we need to start attempting great things for God in our prayer closets, um, in our intercessory. I, I dare you, take your prayers up a notch. Quit, quit with these feeble, tame prayers. Pray to a God who hears, a God who can move mountains, a God who can do anything, who can stir in hearts. Uh, pray with more ambition. All right, number two, look at verse three. And sorry, we're moving rather quickly tonight, but as our desire to finish this, if, if possible tonight, look at verse three. He says, but the Lord is faithful who shall establish you and keep you 
from evil. Number two, jot this down. An endearing church is ambitious with tenacious prayer. Evangelistic prayer, number two, tenacious prayer. There is a tenacity that comes uh, in our hearts when we are praying as we should. Um, And notice that the prayer is not just about being on the offensive. It also is a defensive. It's a grounding. Prayer helps us. I found, um, and probably you know this too, but those who quit on God first quit praying to God and walking in the Spirit and those internal disciplines. And so prayer helps us to stay faithful and consistent when we're tempted to be otherwise. Isn't it wonderful, the contrast between verse 2 and 3? So he talks about these evil ones who are unreasonable, how foolish to reject the loving message of the gospel, and they are unfaithful. But then he says in verse 3, but the Lord is faithful who shall establish you and keep you from evil. And so we, we stick with God, we press into God, and he sustains us through, during those, uh, those dry seasons. He's faithful to confirm us to the end, 1 Corinthians 1.9. He's faithful to deliver us out of all temptation, 1 Corinthians 10.13. He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins, cleanse us from all unrighteousness, 1 John verse 9. And the list goes on and on. He is faithful, he is faithful, he is faithful. And so prayer uh, helps us to stay with God, to be faithful to him, because first he is faithful to us. Warren Wearsby, in response to this section, says this, he is faithful That statement is the watchword of the steadfast Christian. I'll tell you, the person you know who doesn't quit on God, the person who is faithful, is regularly praying to themselves and to God, God, you are faithful. Be faithful. Prove yourself in this situation. May we be more emphasizing that uh, in our prayers. All right, verse 4. And we have confidence in the Lord touching you, or in regard to you, that you both do and will do the things which we command you. And so you see, not all have faith in verse 3. The Lord is faithful in verse 4. And then he says, and and I know that you also will be faithful. God will enable you to to persevere in the things that God has revealed to you. Verse 5, and the Lord direct your hearts in the love of God and the patient waiting for Christ. Here we have again this reference to Christ who is coming. Um, And I love the tone of verse 5. The Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. Have you noticed that when we're waiting on God, many times it's easy for bitterness to creep in, um, for impatience, irritability to creep in? Prayer helps us to persist during those seasons. Prayer helps us to be tenacious where we're tempted to quit. And so he invites them and encourages them to, to press into Christ, to rely upon him and allow him to sustain them through this season of persecution they were facing. Just a thought tonight, a takeaway from this first section. Only the things that we keep praying for when things get tough or things go longer than we would prefer truly have our ambitions connected to them. You can say you care about a soul. You can say you want to be faithful to Christ. But unless you're praying on that, I don't know that you actually long to with the fervency of ambition we're talking about tonight. Um, if you don't care enough to pray, you probably don't care enough to persevere. Uh, so I encourage you to check that and to, to refine that through the gift and discipline of prayer. Just a thought tonight, we are between the spiritual birthday. I think most, if not all of us, know Christ as Savior. I assume that. If not, you're welcome, and we would invite you into a relationship with Christ tonight. But we're between our spiritual birthday and the culmination of all things. The only way to persevere in this in-between period is through prayer. Uh, We've emphasized it all year. We can only continue being instant in prayer. We have to give ourselves to that discipline. So Paul invites them, based upon the day of the Lord, to be more ambitious with their prayers. Um, And I came across an interesting picture. I don't know this pastor personally, but I know indirectly I do. Show you the picture first. You kind of the lighting's not real good there, but there's a man sitting on the right in a chair. He's telling a, a Bible story to a group of kids. And the caption associated with this picture, uh, dear man that um, I know shared it on behalf of another guy said this, prayer is just as big as God is. My younger brother, Israel, is the man pictured there telling the story, was a prodigal for a few years. Family kept praying for him and he, quote, came back. Last year, he, he entered evangelism and has done eight mission preaching trips to Mexico. And our church just started supporting him. And that was the pastor who posted that. This, this young man was a prodigal. 
And now he's regularly, I mean, eight times in the last just little bit, he's been to Mexico witnessing and being, he's going into evangelism. He has a heart for the ministry. Who are you praying for right now that isn't there yet, but could be if God would work in their hearts? Where is the ambition uh, in our prayers? Prayer is just as big uh, as God is. All right, number two, let's go now to verse number six. And there's a second ambition that needs to be increased in our hearts as we consider the day of the Lord which is to come. Look at verse 6. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the tradition which he has received of us. Number two, and this kind of dovetails well with the finish of our work ethic series that we finished up this morning, ambitious vocation. Ambitious vocation. I may give you a couple things underneath of this um, that God gives us through the Apostle Paul as it relates to our vocation, that as we see the day of the Lord coming, we should have greater, not lesser, ambition. Number one, jot this down, an endearing church is ambitious with confrontational vocation. Confrontational vocation. And we see this referenced in verses 7 through 9, where Paul gives these rebukes, these direct uh, confrontations by his uh, his own ministry there. Look at verse 7. What's he talking about here in verse 6? For you yourselves know how, we ought to, how you ought to follow us, for we be saved ourselves, uh, not ourselves, disorderly among you. Notice verse 8. Neither do we eat any man's uh, bread for naught, uh, but wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you. All right, let me give you a couple things underneath of this confrontational vocation. If you remember, we talked about this a few weeks ago, the Thessalonians were thinking, Jesus is coming back, let's all quit our jobs, and let's just let's hold out till Jesus comes. And Paul says, nothing could be further from uh, what I have taught you and what I have modeled to you. All right, number one, confrontational example. Jot that down, confrontational example. And we see this through the example of Paul. He confronted this teaching. He says, listen, remember me the tireless industry, the hard work, the fact I was self-supporting. Um, he, he didn't abandon his tent making just because he knew the Lord or knew the Lord was coming again. He kept laboring. Think about Paul. The man was writing the Bible. He had important things going on, and yet he took the time to make tents. If Paul saw that as a priority, then probably we should. That, the, just the day-to-day -day grind. I think I mentioned this before, but I struggle with this even as a pastor. You may think, well, pastor, you know, that's all you do the whole time is, you know, pray and read the Bible. I have a lot of administrative things or just, you know, things that are, that all of us do in, in, in work. And it's the tempting thing is if I weren't doing this, I could do more spiritual things. It, it's, I hope you've gotten from our study on Sunday mornings, it's all spiritual. The, the people who cleaned this room this week, you would notice if they hadn't done it for at least a couple of weeks. Um, the, the, the bulletins. And I mean, there's so many things that make up even what we do that in and of themselves maybe aren't real spiritual, but they contribute. Those of you that work this week and then are giving today and supporting the church. And I mean, the list goes on and on. And so we need to see our vocation with uh, a more clear focus as a result of the day of the Lord. Uh, and in verse eight, he says, no one can accuse him of, uh, of, uh, of not working himself and being a, a load or a burden to others. Verse nine, he says, not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an ensample unto you to follow us. In other places, Paul talked about that there's nothing wrong with someone to, who labors in the word and in doctrine to, to live from the gospel and for God's people to support him. And our church does well at that. But he says, for me and for the example that I was setting, uh, you saw that I continued to work. And his point here is that Christians should not expect other people to take care of them, even if the day of the Lord is coming. That don't be a freeloader. Don't, don't be uh, dead weight, as we would say. Do your part, whatever that looks like. We're not talking about disability or some of those exceptions, but do your best. Uh, have that example. Be that example uh, of the believer. And so the ambition that is holy in the church is not self-serving, but self-sacrificing. Um, this church and every church striving to, to do big and dream big for God is doing so not because they're trying to get something, but because they're trying to give something. And I would just say this, for those of you that ambition, that word makes you nervous. Those who have ambition, a godly, sacred ambition, are not going to do less because of that ambition. They're going to have to do more. Having a bigger church or having a bigger ministry or having a better job or whatever God has put in you that's at a holy, not a selfish ambition, you're going to have to do more until Jesus comes. 
Uh, so be careful in how you view that. And Paul said, listen, as our ministry grew, it took more of our time. It took more of our effort. Don't be found in the crowd of those who are freeloading where they need to be faithful. All right, look, if you will, then at verse number six. Go back to verse six. He says this, now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. I don't think you know how strong that is, that he invokes the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He uses all three of those names that you would draw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly and not after the tradition which he has received of us. And so we see, secondly, jot this down, not only confrontational example, number two, confrontational words. Confrontational words. We have a couple of sub-points under this point alone tonight. Confrontational example, number two, confrontational words. Um, there's a story out of Colorado Springs um, a week or so ago I, I almost can't believe this story. I always say that, and then it you know, actually doesn't shock you in our day. Um, but the state of Colorado has suspended the license, according to the article, for Play Mountain Place Daycare in Colorado Springs after 26 children were found in a basement behind a false wall. They were actually, the, the, what got them called was all these kids kept coming in, and the neighbors like, how are they keeping all these kids in a safe environment? And here they were actually locking up some of the kids in the basement and hiding them. Uh, and they heard the noise and had to work through this false wall to find them and obviously have revoked their, their license. And I'm sure there are legal actions that will be taken. And not about you. When I find out about that stuff, I'd love to have five minutes to just share what I have to say and feel to those people. Um, I'm willing to speak on those things. But for some reason, as the day of the Lord comes, God's people become quieter where we need to speak up. Um, I hope that you realize maybe it's not politically correct, but it is still spiritually um, your responsibility to speak up when God prompts you to do so, whatever that looks like. Be willing to say a word for Christ. Be willing to, to confront even that which is wrong and to do so with the right spirit. And Paul says here in verse 6, hold on, i got to say something here. This is something I have to say to be faithful to you and faithful to Christ. Are you found in that category? And so Paul is willing to share with them these warnings these confrontations. And, and he says here in verse number six, to separate from them. That, that's tough to do, is it not? You know, we're friends and, and we've had some years together, but, but where you're headed, I can't be a part of that. And so we see him willing to, to invoke this and to encourage the church to separate from those who are disorderly. All right, go down to verse 10 now. And he begins to deal with the specific issues that have expanded that he earlier had dealt with uh, in these letters to the church. Look at verse 10. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. Um, and so we see him beginning to confront with words the specific issues. And he says here, the individuals in view were those who could not, uh, were not those who could not work, but those who would not work. They were not willing to do so. And he commands them that they are to do their work, and if they're not willing to work, they cannot have the benefits uh, that come with that work. Verse 11, for we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busy bodies. And so he moves from this example and this kind of general principle, if a man doesn't work, he shouldn't eat, to dealing with the specific issue of busy bodies. You ever notice that those who are busy are not busy bodies, and those who are not busy are busy bodies? Those two things parallel each other. Um, I regularly, I don't know if you realize, but in my world, in my life, I deal with a lot of folks in ministry, and I found those who are busy getting the job done and have a holy ambition to reach souls and train disciples and plant churches, they don't have time to dissect each other, talk about each other. If someone does, I get real nervous. <laughs> what, what are you doing? How do you have time today to deal with this and talk about this? I think all of us had to have that spirit. We need to be busy for the Lord until he comes for us. In fact, a quick example of that as it relates, not necessarily picking on the ladies, but this example that Paul gives later. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 5. And, and just this word of admonition as we process busy bodies versus those with genuine needs. We're not discounting those who have a legitimate need, but we need to be discerning as it relates to them. 1 Timothy chapter 5, look if you will at verse 11. And this would be one example later where Paul, through the man Timothy, um, gives this instruction on how to process specifically widows. Look at verse 11 of chapter 5 of 1 Timothy. He says this, but the younger widows refuse, uh, refuse to help them or to, to over um, support them. For when they have begun to wax wanton against Christ, they will marry. 
having damnation because they have cast off their first faith. Notice now verse 13, with all they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house, and not only idle, but tattlers also and busybodies, speaking things which they ought not. I will therefore that younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. For some are already turned aside after Satan. If any man or woman that believeth have widows, let them relieve them. Let not the church be charged that it may relieve them that are, notice this, widows indeed. And so you see this discernment between someone who genuinely needs help and someone who is being a burden and at the expense of others, they have now too much free time on their hand and this busy bodiness uh, begins to creep in. You have a choice of how you'll spend your last days before Christ comes or you're with Christ. I don't want to be a busybody. I want to be busy for the Lord. I don't want to dissect what others should be doing for God until He comes. I want to be a part of doing what God wants to do before uh, He returns for us. All right, go back to our text in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. And look, if you will, now at verse 12. He says this, Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's this exhortation again, chapter 3 of 2 Thessalonians verse, 13, or verse 12 that with quietness they work, notice now the positive, here's what you should do, with quietness they work and eat their own bread. And I, there's something about that verse that's just kind of steadying. I think we've talked about this a few other times, probably in our work ethic series. Because Jesus Christ is coming, I can just focus on what's right in front of me. Um, some of you, some may be tempted to say, Pastor, you're a bit simplistic in your thinking, but I honestly don't spend a lot of time with cable news. I don't spend a lot of time processing the worst case scenarios that the experts can conjure up. I have no control over that. I can't even process what you just said and what I should feel and know and react to it. But I do know I have kids to raise. I have a church to pastor. I have lost people all around me that need to hear the gospel. And there's something about the immediate, don't you love that verse? He just says, just be quiet, eat your bread, work your job, do your part, and let God handle the big picture. And I think the day of the Lord, if Jesus is coming back, then it's going to be okay. He's going to resolve all these issues. And so it frees us to just do our little part as a grandparent or a young person or a, a median adult. We can just do our job and do our part. And when he shows up, all these things will be resolved. And so the question tonight is, what new heights could our church reach if everybody was just pulling their weight? Jesus is coming back. Are you doing your job? Am I doing mine? Just do your job. Do your part and let God uh, culminate it with his powerful presence and return before us. Your faithful shouldering of your, quote, little task keep you out of others' business and help all of us add up to something that is powerfully effective for the Lord who is soon to return. Um, the other day, someone was contrasting how the world thinks versus how Jesus thinks, and they made this little pithy comment. They said, the world says, you do you. That's, have you ever heard that? It drives me crazy. I hate that expression, especially because of what that often entails. You do you, whatever that is. Jesus says, you follow me. That's the difference. And the church is often doing that. You just do you, and I'll do me. Instead of Jesus says, you follow me, you're my bride, you're, you're who I've redeemed, I'm coming back for you. May we be faithful to follow him in this area of ambition. All right, number two, quickly, not only is the endearing church ambitious uh, with confrontational vocation, how we do our work, we are willing to be a good example and to call out those who are not. Number two, an endearing church is ambitious with distinctive vocation. Look at verse 13. An endearing church is ambitious with distinctive vocation. It's unique. It's, it's a hallmark kind of thing. It's significant. It's different. Verse 13, but you brethren, be not weary uh, in well-doing. Be not weary in well-doing. Is there another verse that comes to your mind when you hear that? Uh, Galatians chapter 6, verse 9, be not weary in well-doing, for in due season you reap if you faint not. Verse goes on to talk about if you sow the flesh, you'll reap corruption, you sow the spirit, you'll reap life everlasting. What's interesting is the construction of this word is different than that one. That one in Galatians chapter 6 is, is, is trying to encourage them to actually engage in well-doing and to do so specifically in the context there of giving and investing. Here he's saying you're already doing it, just don't quit. Don't be weary in the well-doing you're already engaged in. And so may we be not weary, may we not give up, may we not fade, may we reach, may we stretch to the finish line, being persistent 
in the vocation God has given. Don't be depressed. Don't give up. Don't fade. Be faithful. All right, verse 14. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him that he may be ashamed. And then I love this kind of balancing thought. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. And so maybe be willing to separate from those who are not working out God's will in their lives properly, but to do so with this right spirit, to admonish, uh, to beseech uh, as a brother. Um, I had a conversation recently. We, often, we use this term some. I don't know if you've heard me say this, but I talk about the core of our church. The, 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 the core of our church is a term we use regularly. And I just want to clarify tonight, anybody is welcome to be a part of the core of North Life Baptist Church. Anybody. You want to receive Christ as Savior, you want to follow in scriptural baptism, you want to join the local church, you want to get involved in using your spiritual gifts, come on, let's go, all right? Anybody's welcome to do that. But half-hearted kind of effort and commitment to Christ, you can't be a part of the core with that spirit. And I, I, I sense that. It's, it's nothing personal. It's just, you got to want it. you got to want Christ and want His will in your life. And I know I'm preaching at the choirs, we would say. We don't even have a choir. You guys are the choir. I know I'm saying it. You're here on a Sunday night after all you ate this last week. You're still here, I think. <laughs> you know, you're here. I, I get that. But isn't it amazing how everybody wants to play the victim and you, you don't want me or you don't appreciate my giftedness or whatever? It, Jesus is coming back. Get in. Jump in. You're welcome. And if I'm not in, encourage me. And that's what Paul is saying. This guy has given his life. He's been stoned to death. And he's saying, listen, just d distance yourselves from those who are half-hearted and love them and extend to them the invitation, but press forward. Be distinct in your labor for the Lord. The church with high, high holy ambition for the glory of God and the gospel of Jesus cannot efficiently do those goals by just lowering the bar to the lowest common denominator. What's average today? What's acceptable today? Quote, unquote. The ambitious church has high expectations because Jesus is soon to come. All right, hold your place there. We need to look at it. Go to Philippians, would you, for a moment? Philippians chapter number 3. And look, if you will, at verse 14. Philippians chapter 3, I love these verses that give to it, just ooze with a sanctified ambition uh, through Paul. Paul didn't just preach this, he lived this. Philippians chapter 3, and if you would quickly look at verse number 14. Paul says this, after saying, I, I haven't arrived, is basically the summary of verse 13. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect or mature, be thus minded, and if anything ye otherwise are minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk, so as ye have uh, us for an example. See kind of the parallels here with 1 Thessalonians 3. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, See that tone there that he just said in the verse that we read, verse 13, this tenderness, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. See that colon there? Now he's going to unpack who is an enemy of the cross, whose end is destruction, who God, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is their shame, who mind earthly things. For our conversation, here's now the day of the Lord, for our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. Forget the belly, forget the, the pleasantries and the, the earthly things. He's changing all that, according to the working there whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Do you see how the day of the Lord gave to Paul an ambition? He pressed toward the mark, not just a generic mark, but the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And so may we have that ambition in our labor and in our work, may we have this holy ambition. All right, lastly, go back to our text and let's look at verse 16. And we see a third ambitious characteristic we need to be a dear church until Jesus comes back for us. 2 Thessalonians 3, and let's pick up in verse 16. And these last three verses are very important to the series and to our study tonight. Now the Lord of peace, 2 Thessalonians 3.16, Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always. By all means, the Lord be with you all. Thirdly and lastly, we need ambitious stewardship. Ambitious stewardship. 
Paul has now prayed over the Thessalonians in this, this list, in these two letters, four times. This is his fourth prayer that he prays over these Thessalonians. In chapter 1, verses 11 and 12, in chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, and in chapter 3 and verse 5, um, we see Paul praying. And that's, this is specifically only in 2 Thessalonians. He's now prayed over them four times. And, and so he moves from correction or confrontation to now intercession. He is praying to God and asking God to help them to be stewards, good stewards with what God has entrusted to them. Um, I don't know that we realize how much we have been given. Um, I was thinking this morning as Brother Andrew was teaching on Joseph, Joseph, Joseph navigated all those temptations, all those low points in his life without a, a copy of God's Word. As far as we know, he had no, no Scripture to reference. He, he didn't have the Holy Spirit living in him in the sense that we do today as a New Testament believer. He was at such a disadvantage to where we are as local New Testament believers. As a local New Testament believer, we have so much more at our disposal. And my question to you is, what are we doing with it? Where's the ambition? God gave us His Word to preach it, to, 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 to declare it, to see folks stirred and changed by it. It's not ours just to hold on to until Jesus comes. We're to sow. Remember the stewards? The one who hid it and then blamed the, the master for it? I know you're a hard man. God gives us things for us to use them, to invest them. And so we need to be ambitious with our stewardship. I would encourage especially our senior saints and those that are middle age and up, do something new for God. Launch into something until He comes. Don't, don't settle. It may look different than it did at 20 or 30 or 40, but, but, but be ambitious with your stewardship. Don't waste these years. Don't waste this remaining time until Jesus comes. Uh, be ambitious. And I came across this, and I think for us men, this challenged me when I read this. Somebody just jotted down some challenges to the men. Men, get up. Go to church. Sit in the front. Lift up your hands in gratitude. Worship. Pray. Give. Listen. Take notes. Respond. Celebrate. Lead your family. Be strong. Be a man. Just have some ambition. Men, come on, guys. Starting with me, where's, where's the ambition? I have these young souls in my home. I have, I have this place of influence and leadership and service. I, I want to see you do something, God, before you come back. Be ambitious with stewardship. All right, let's talk about a couple of areas related to that. Number one, in verse 16, an endearing church, jot this down, is ambitious with peace-filled stewardship. Peace-filled stewardship. An endearing church is ambitious with peace-filled stewardship. We have the peace of God. We know how the story ends. And if we know how the story ends, then what we do between the time we know how the story ends and it actually culminates with the return of Jesus Christ, we will answer for that. We have the peace of God. We know it's all going to work out. Are we living like that? Are we living in light of that and how we relate to others? Or is there panic? Is there fear where there needs to be faith? And I love the language here in verse 16 where he says, notice, give you peace always by all means. Always by all means. And I think this indicates that a Christian in a church can enjoy peace no matter what the setting and no matter what they're navigating when they're in right relationship with God. Um, you may know this if you're a part of our inner you know, core, as we used that word a moment ago. You're an, an active, engaged member. But we've had some difficult seasons as a church. But one of the things, and, and maybe we're, we'll have some more this winter, who knows, and things that you have faced and that I have faced. But it is possible to have peace all the time. Because we know Jesus is coming back. We know it's going to end okay. How are we stewarding that emotion? How are we stewarding that soul-level comfort that the day of the Lord, the return of Christ, gives to us? If we don't have to worry about our survival and our safety, what could we do if we got our eyes off of that? Who could we impact? Instead of being fearful, we launch out in faith. Uh, what new initiatives, what new uh, projects and pursuits and ministries could we be a part of if we would stop playing it so safe. And I regularly bring that up in our business meetings and other things we have as far as our finances and decisions. We need to, we're not trying to just preserve something. We're trying to, to extend with our chest to the finish line when Christ comes, that our church is found faithful. We're not just trying to maintain, we're trying to grow. May God help each of us to do that individually. All right, notice the end of verse 16. He says, the Lord be with you all. And praying that the Lord will be with them all. Paul is not implying that God is not with them all of the time. I think rather, it seems to indicate he's praying that fellowship with Christ 
as they're faithful to obey his word, might be the portion for every believer, including the believers he just said to separate from. He's saying, may the Lord be with you all. He, he longs for that, that closeness and that filling of God's peace to be true of each of them as they obey the Lord. Um, just a thought tonight, and God's been working in me on this. Why does God give us his peace? Not why do you want his peace or why are you willing to receive his peace? Why does God offer to you peace? And here's my, here's my challenge to you. I believe this with all my heart. God does not give you his peace just so you can sleep like a baby at night. So you can deal with the stresses in your life. God gives you his peace so you can be productive for him. If you have peace, now you can follow him. You can listen to him. You can be guided by his spirit. How are you using, how are you stewarding the peace of God that he has given to you? And sometimes the peace helps you to sleep so the next morning you can get up and do what he's called you to do. His peace is meant to do something. How are you stewarding that? The other day I heard someone say this. I thought it was appropriate on the heels of, of Thanksgiving. But they said, sometimes I joke about what I'd do if I had one day to live. Just kind of tongue in cheek. And he, the, the guy I was reading said, maybe eat that junk food you know, that I know will kill me. It's, if it's my last day, who cares? Or go crazy or get something off my chest I've wanted to say for years. Whatever the case may be. But if I had one day to live, what would I do? And then he said this. Today it hit me. Jesus knew, and he washed feet, and he washed feet. I think sometimes we know how the story ends, and then we think this margin between the two is for me, to enjoy it or do something with it. How are you being a steward with knowing the days are short, the day is short, the night is far spent, the day is at hand, this day of the Lord. May we be faithful with the peace that God has given. All right, number two, look at verse 17. The salutation of Paul with mine own hand, which is, to, which is the token in every epistle, so I write. And then in verse 18 that we'll get, in just, get to in just a moment, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Number two, jot this down. An endearing church should be ambitious with grace-filled stewardship. Peace-filled stewardship. Number two, grace-filled stewardship. How many of you uh, today, when you're walking through the hallway to our central lobby, which doesn't that new trim look good? Brother Moore's been working on that and uh, just dresses that up. I don't have uh, drywall dust on my suit coat every morning now, maybe. I always would bump into it during greeting time. But uh, I don't know if you noticed, Pastor uh, Dave now has an office in our kitchen. It's a kitchen as in it's called the kitchen. There's nothing kitcheny in it other than storage. But somebody put a little sign on his door. I could guess who it was, not that I gave that away with a trim comment. Uh, but uh, on his door, it says Cotner's Kitchen. So Dave has an office in the room that also is our kitchen, which probably is not a smart decision, whoever's idea that was. And they have this, uh, hopefully I get this right, home of contextualization and cherry cuisine is what's on there. No mention of cheesecake, by the way, Brother Moore, but uh, they put that on his door. If you walk by, you have to check that out. But uh, Pastor Dave is a big fan of food, and so that may, he may not be getting anything done in there other than he cleans out our fridge. So you know how church, church fridges can be scary. You know, they grow things if you're not careful. So he'll keep that, that beat back for us a bit with his uh, office hours. But it's just interesting to me to think about the grace of God in our lives and how it fills our lives. One of the ways that God's grace fills our lives is it, it promises us the day of the Lord. It gives us the power we need to wait upon that day and to persevere until that day. And again, the question would be, how are we stewarding the grace of God? Now, Paul puts his identity, uh, he connects it and affirms it here at the end of the letter. Do you notice in verse 17, he says, The salutation of Paul with mine own hand, which is the token in every epistle, so I write. Um, and I, I, this is just a bit of supposition, but have you ever heard someone talk about or speak to the thorn in the flesh that Paul references at the end of 2 Corinthians? What was the thorn in the flesh that he besought the Lord thrice and, and it was a messenger from Satan and God just said, my grace is sufficient. My grace is sufficient. I would tend to guess that eyesight was at least a part of his struggle. Um, if you think about, and I, I would say that based on several little subtle references in his epistles, but he was in dark, damp environments, um, to candlelight, he's reading scripture, he's writing scripture. I mean, think about that. Here's a guy reading scripture and writing scripture. What a, I mean, just mind-boggling to think about. But all of that was done, not in a well-lit room, whether you think this is great lighting or not, fluorescent lighting, not necessarily my favorite, but at least I can see my, I can read. And he would deal in those dark, 
uh, damp cells and to candlelight at best. He would interact with reading. And so it's very likely that he couldn't see well. And so a lot of these epistles and its reference here at the end of even this one a bit were written by someone who represented him. He would speak the words as God gave them to him, whatever that would have looked like. He wasn't a zombie. He knew what he was uh, conveying and knew that it was from the Lord. But then someone else would write. But he says here in verse 17, notice the penmanship here. I am signing this letter. Why is that important? Go back to chapter 2 of 2 Thessalonians, and you will notice in verse number 2 that Paul did this very purposely, especially to this church because of some things that they were navigating in relation to the day of the Lord. And we won't rehash this completely, but just look at verse 2. He says that you be not soon shaken. Remember we talked about being stabilized by the day of the Lord. That's how we're more endearing as a church. Stabilized, uh, not shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word. Notice this, nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. So he's saying, unlike those letters, this is my letter. This is from me. Obviously, the fact it came from Paul asserted that this is now coming from God. This is a faithful representation of the day of the Lord. But it also connected it to the person of Paul. Who more perfectly conveyed or, or fleshed out the grace of God in a wise stewardship of the grace of God than Paul did? Um, in fact, I would remind you of 1 Corinthians 15.10. Paul says this, But by the grace of God I am what I am. And His grace was bestowed upon me, uh, that was bestowed upon me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which is with me. Paul was ambitious with the grace of God. He says, what I am is only by the grace of God, but because I had that grace, I worked, I labored. There was ambition there. Just a thought tonight. If we have the grace of God, the grace of the God who is coming back for us, there is nothing that's impossible. God may choose not to do it, but the grace of God takes all that off the table. We can do, we can be, we can grow, we can serve, we can be faithful, be ambitious as a steward with the tremendous, glorious grace of God. All right, verse 18, and we'll end here tonight, obviously, which is where Paul ends. Look at verse 18. Now we speak of this grace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. And I want you to go back to the first letter of Thessalonians and notice the difference between the closing verse. Go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and he says this, all right, we just read the last verse of 2 Thessalonians. Go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and verse 28. He says, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, amen. What word is added in 2 Thessalonians? Be with what? You all. And it's interesting to me that Paul includes this word as opposed to the first one. What do you think it is a call to? Why does he include the word all? I think it's a call to unity. Uh, it's a call of inclusion. He's saying to you all, even to you that are disorderly, that I directly rebuked earlier in this letter, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. There's a day coming that, 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 that is bigger than these issues and these points of division and even this wrong that's being done. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And the question tonight is, have we all aligned with the grace of God? And if, if all those we know have yet to be aligned with the grace of God, there's more to do, there's more to accomplish, and there are folks that you need to reach and I need to reach with the grace of God. As He leads and guides us, may we be good stewards with the grace of God. God's grace definitely declares that we have not arrived or that we should uh, let up. God has more that He longs to do. And every day that I receive God's grace is God telling me there's more I want to do. There's more I want to do through you. Don't settle into grace. Don't, don't step back with grace. Press into what God has called you to grow into. Be rightly ambitious. Help our church to possess that same sanctified ambition. All right, let's end tonight in Acts 14. Would you go there? Acts chapter 14. And let's begin in verse 19. And this is one of my favorite stories. I wish I could, if I get to rewind any, if there's any replay options, this is probably my top 10 after, you know, the empty tomb and there are a lot of them probably. It's, I think it's in my top 10 as I start listing them. But just a really neat moment to show um, the ambition of Paul. Um, I love this story. <laughs> Acts chapter 14 and verse 19. Before we look at that, this picture. Um, saw this a few months ago. 
Um, I think it actually is on an Indian reservation. A uh, missionary uh, church planner took a picture of this and said this, church is not a building, it's the people. And you just see, you know, you see a couple logs up on some stacks of bricks and you see a lady sitting and I think there's a dog off to the side and then just, just a few folks. But isn't that a church? If, if, if they know Christ is Savior and Christ is, Christ is coming back for little clusters of people like this one. Um, he's coming back for our crowd, with those we're even missing tonight, and he's coming back for them, even if they're skipping tonight. He's still going to be faithful to them, all right? You let them know that. You see him this week. God is faithful, but it's about people. And I just, just this thought tonight, if he's coming back for us, who, the church who is his people, then, then he ought to find us with some zeal. He ought to find us with some passion. He ought to find us with some ambition. All right, look here, if you will, in Acts chapter 14, in verse 19. Uh, it gives us a little antidote, this little story in the midst of all that God was doing in the early churches that is just mind-boggling to actually think about. Verse 19, And there came thither certain Jews from Antioch and Iconium, which persuaded the people, and having stoned Paul, all right, hold on, they just stoned the great apostle Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. We don't know for sure if he was dead, but at least he looked dead, and, and for all intents and purposes, he was dead. Verse 20, Howbeit, as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up. I love that part of the story. And came into the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. And when they had preached the gospel to that city, and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and Iconium and Antioch. They go back to the same places. I love that. I love that about Paul. I probably wouldn't have went with him, but I love that he did it, okay? Verse 22, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith, and that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. And they passed through Pisidia and Pamphylia, and the list goes on. And they go on to all these other places. What I find interesting about the story is that Paul would not quit. He had a window of time. He had a calling from God. And no matter what happened and literally what was thrown at him, he just kept getting up and kept going. Um, I think in many ways where we've gone off the rails is not that things are getting worse, it's that we have stopped pressing into our responsibilities. Um, Christians of days gone by, I will challenge you with this and I will, I, will, I will hold you to this. I don't think talked as much about politics as we do. I don't think Christians of days gone by got bogged down in inner kind of factions and divisiveness like we do. They just focused on what God had called them to do. And if we would get back to that and knowing the day of the Lord is coming for us, I think there's much more we could see God do through us. Uh, that's my clarion call tonight. Hold me to that standard. Let me hold you to that standard. And let's see what God will do. He's waiting to come back for a reason, isn't he? Maybe it's the person you can reach and I can reach if we'll pray and we'll work and we'll, we'll be faithful until he does return for us. All right, let me give you this final kind of, and if you want it, you could probably Google it and find it, but it's called the Fellowship uh, of the Redeemed, um, of the Unashamed, I'm sorry, and it's a great um, quote. It was actually found, many when I've seen it, they've attributed to anonymous, but actually it has been attributed to an author. Um, the prayer was originally titled the Zimbabwe uh, Martyr's Prayer. It was found in the papers of a young African pastor who was martyred in Zimbabwe over 100 years ago. According to documentation from the Southern Nazarene University, the prayer was passed on uh, by a missionary named Louise Robin, uh, Robinson Chapman, who served in Africa from 1920 to 1940. Years later, the prayer became known as the Fellowship of the Unashamed. While some of the surrounding circumstances are not specifically recorded, it is clear that this resilient pastor was likely martyred for his refusal to renounce his faith in Christ. And here is this expression of ambition and zeal, uh, that now this man is with the Lord. Here's, here's the statement. He says, I'm part of the fellowship of the unashamed. I have the Holy Spirit's power. The die has been cast. I have stepped over the line. The decision has been made. I am a disciple of his. I won't look back, let up, slow down, back away, or be still. My past is redeemed. My present makes sense. My future is secure. Notice that. I am finished and done with low living, sight walking, smooth knees, colorless dreams, tamed visions, worldly talking, cheap giving, and dwarfed goals. I no longer need preeminence, prosperity, position, promotions, plaudits, or popularity. I don't have to be right, first, 
tops, recognized, praised, regarded, or rewarded. I now live by faith, lean in His presence, walk by patience, am uplifted by prayer, and I labor with power. My face is set, my gate is fast, my goal is heaven, my road is narrow, my way is rough, my companions few, my guide reliable, my mission clear. I cannot be bought, compromised, detoured, lured away, turned back, deluded, or delayed. I will not flinch in the face of sacrifices, hesitate in the presence of the enemy, pander at the pool of popularity, or meander in the maze of mediocrity. This guy was a great writer, but more importantly, passionate. He says this in conclusion, I won't give up, shut up, let up until I've stayed up, stored up, prayed up, paid up, preached up for the cause of Christ. I am a disciple of Jesus. I must go till he comes, give till I drop, preach till all know, and work till he stops me. And when he comes for his own, you'll have no problem recognizing me. My banner is clear. That's ambition. And the temptation is we, we just look around. Well, I guess I'm a little bit ahead, or at least my head's leaning a little forward in the passion category compared to the average Christian. Forget the average Christian. Jesus is coming back. Tell me that. Let me tell you that as well when we tend to vacillate where we need to be faithful. Here's the question. We're done. Will you help our church grow dearer to God and dearer to others with ambitious prayer? I dare you to pray more ambitious prayers. Number two, with ambitious vocation, as we've studied. Do your job with all of your heart starting tomorrow. Do your calling. Do do your mission in the home and out of the home. Do it with all of who you are. And thirdly, will you do so with ambitious stewardship? Let the peace of God, the presence of God, and His grace do something with it. Do something with it that brings Him glory and honor. Let's pray together. Father, thank You for Your Word tonight. Thank You for these dear folks.